We are currently making our way through the book of Galatians, so if you want to open your Bible up, we are going to be going to Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 to 14. That is Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 to 14. Today's message is titled, By Faith or By Works. By Faith or By Works. O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive this spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun by the spirit? Are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain? If indeed it was in vain, does he who supplies, supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Curse be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. For the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. May God bless the reading of his word. Paul's letter to the Galatians was most likely established during his first missionary journey. Paul and Barnabas went to the Roman province of Galatia, where they planted churches and shared the message about Christ. And the Galatians received the message about Christ. Paul and Barnabas returned to Antioch, where they declared all that God had done with them, and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles, according to Acts 14 and verse 27. And shortly after Paul and Barnabas left the region of Galatia, there were these false teachers, known as the Judaizers, who infiltrated the churches. They had basically followed in the footsteps of Paul and Barnabas, and were going to these churches and telling these Gentiles, these non-Jews, that in order to have a right standing with God, they had to be circumcised and adhere to the law of Moses. And the false teachers were spreading a false message. The Judaizers were perverting the gospel of grace by mixing faith with works in order to be made right with God. And Paul is not happy. He opens up in chapter 1 of verse 6 by saying, I am astonished. That you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. The Galatians were in the process of turning to a false gospel. And Paul says in Galatians 3 or verse 1, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. In the first five verses, Paul asks them six questions. The first, who has bewitched you? That would be the false teachers who were adding on to the gospel of grace by telling these Gentiles that they needed to be circumcised and adhere to the law of Moses in order to be saved. And one thing I want you to keep in mind is Paul is writing this to believers because over in Galatians 3, verse 26, Paul says, For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. In Galatians 4, verse 9, Paul says, But now that you have come to know God, 
or rather to be known by God. Paul is writing this to believers. This shows us that Christians can be bewitched and believe something that is false. And just like the Galatians, we can slide into legalism. Legalism is trying to earn God's favor through human effort. If we pray, read our Bibles, go to church on a weekly basis and tithe, those are all good things. But if we are doing that, thinking that you know we're, we're going to have a better standing before God, then just like the Galatians, we slide into what's called legalism. And this is why we constantly need to be reminded of the gospel. Last week we talked about how Peter, who was an apostle, who was an apostle, how he needed to be reminded of the gospel. If Peter needed to be reminded of the gospel, so too do we. So how does Paul counter legalism? By reminding them of the gospel. That it is not what we have done, it's what Christ has done. Christians can be bewitched. Oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Who has cast an evil spell on you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. The meaning of Christ's death and its significance was so clear to the Galatians. It was like someone held up a picture and showed it and showed a picture of the crucifixion to them. That's how clear it was. It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. The proclamation of the good news was so clear to them, it's as if they had become eyewitnesses to the crucifixion. And I mean, that is what Paul preached. You want to know what Paul says over in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 23? But we preach Christ and Him crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and fully to Gentiles. Ten verses later in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 2, you want to know what Paul says? For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That is what Paul preached. The Galatians would have understood the magnitude of Christ's death. That Christ was a sacrifice for our sins. When Christ was on the cross, God looked at Jesus. God treated Jesus as if he lived the life that we live. And the moment a person repents and puts their faith in Jesus Christ, God looks at him or her as if he or she lived the life that Christ lived. Our sins are imputed to Christ, and His righteousness is imputed to us. The Galatians understood the meaning of Christ's death. They would have also known about His resurrection. No doubt the word came to the churches of Galatia with full conviction. Over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5, Paul says, because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power, and in the Holy Spirit, and with full conviction. I believe the gospel came to the churches of Galatia with full conviction. Paul shared the gospel with them. And the Galatians believed the message in which they heard, and are now trying to earn God's favor through human effort. The Galatians have fallen into legalism, and have become foolish and bewitched. Oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Last week at the end of chapter 2, we talked about the doctrine of justification by faith. That we have a right standing with God through faith in Jesus Christ apart from works of the law. That a person is saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. And what Paul does in chapter 3 is he defends that doctrine. The first way he defends this doctrine is through experience. Look at what Paul says in chapter 3 of verse 2. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive this spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? The first way Paul defends this doctrine is through experience. Paul is bringing the Galatians back to their 
conversion experience and is basically asking them how they became Christians. Did you receive this spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Let me ask you this. How did you become a Christian? I want you to think back to your own conversion experience. How did you come to have a relationship with Christ? Was it by works of the law? Was it by you trying to keep the law? Is that how you became a Christian? Was it through human effort? Or was it by what? Hearing with faith. Of course, as Christians, we know that it was by hearing with faith. You heard the message about Christ. You received the Spirit because you believed the message you heard about Christ. It was by hearing with faith. Every Christian has the Holy Spirit indwelling in them. If people do not have the Holy Spirit indwelling in them, it is because they are not true Christians. It doesn't matter what a per it doesn't matter what they profess. It doesn't matter how many hymns they sung or how many times they attended church. If people do not have the Holy Spirit indwelt in them, then they are not true Christians. They have not truly been born again. When Paul came to Ephesus, he found some disciples there. And you want to know what he asked them in Acts 19 and verse 2? Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Paul never asked them if they said the sinner's prayer. And by the way, the sinner's prayer is nowhere to be found in Scripture. Out of 66 books in the Bible, you will not find that anywhere in Scripture. Paul never asked them what denomination they were from. Paul never asked them what church they went to. Paul asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believe? Let me ask you this here this morning. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believe? Did I receive the Holy Spirit when I believe? Is there evidence of that in our life? Because in Romans 8 and verse 11, Paul says, If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. People who are born again will have the Holy Spirit dwelling within them. So Paul takes the Galatians back to their conversion. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? The Galatians would have known from their own personal experience that it was by hearing with faith. They would have understood that they were saved apart from their works. Paul goes on to say, are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Salvation and sanctification are a work of the Holy Spirit. We need Jesus every single day. It's not like we become Christians and then live the Christian life in our own strength. Every single day, we need Jesus. And what God has started, He will finish. Paul says over in Philippians 1 and verse 6, And I am sure of this. Well, what's Paul sure of? That he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. The key to living the Christian life is by allowing Christ to live it through us. We are not trying to live the Christian life in our own power or in our own strength. And maybe you are here this morning and you have fallen away from grace like the Galatians. Maybe you have slid into legalism where you were trying to earn God's favor through human effort. Maybe you're trying to live the Christian life in your own power or in your own strength instead of allowing Christ to live it through you. And the Galatians have fallen from the gospel of grace and are trying to earn God's favor through human effort. They are trying to have a right saying with God through the law. And you might be saying, well, James, how do we know that? Well, it tells us later in the letter. We read, you who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. 
The Galatians were listening to the false teachers who were telling them they needed to be circumcised and adhere to the law of Moses in order to be saved. And I believe the Galatians were trying to live the Christian life in their own power and in their own strength instead of allowing Christ to what? Live it through them. So from Galatians 3 verses 1 to 5, we see that Paul defends the doctrine of justification by faith through experience. He brings them back to their conversion. They would have understood that they received the Spirit by hearing with faith. The second way Paul defends this doctrine of justification by faith is through Scripture. Look at what he says in verse 6 of chapter 3. Just as Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, Maybe the false teachers were talking about Moses and the giving of the law. And I can just see Paul saying, do you want a history lesson? Because I'm going to give you one. You want to talk about Moses? Well, I'm going to take you back even further. And he takes them all the way back to Abraham. How is Abraham justified? How did Abraham have a right standing with God? Was it by works? Or was it by hearing with faith? Abraham was justified by faith. Paul brings them all the way back to Genesis 15 to verse 6. Where it says, and he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. And this is what Paul is highlighting. That Abraham did not have a right standing with God by his works. It was through genuine faith. You know, some people think the Old Testament people are saved by works, and in the New Testament people are saved through faith. Paul makes it clear, it's always been by faith. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. And another interesting thing to note is that Abraham had a right standing with God before he was circumcised. Which shows that circumcision is not necessary for salvation. Because what were the false teachers telling the Galatians? They needed to be what? Circumcised in order to be saved. And Paul highlights this over in Romans 4 verse 10. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? He's talking about Abraham. It was not after but before he was circumcised. Paul makes the point that Abraham had a right standing with God before he was circumcised. Circumcision isn't necessary for salvation. There are no prerequisites to come to Christ. And I think a lot of people think they need to go away and clean themselves up first before coming to Christ. It's the complete opposite. We come to Christ just as we are. Christ is the one who cleans us up. Verse 7 says... Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. All believers, whether Jews or Gentiles, are Abraham's spiritual children because they follow his example of faith. And Abraham's faith was followed by radical obedience. True faith will produce works, but we are not saved by our works. So Paul defends the doctrine of justification by faith, through experience and through scripture. And Paul makes it very clear throughout this letter to the Galatians that no one will have a right standing with God by works of the law. He says in verse 10, For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. If we want to reject the gospel of grace and try and have a right standing with God by works, then we are under a curse. Curse be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Paul is quoting from Deuteronomy 27 or verse 26. And it's like Paul is saying, have you forgotten the last book of the law? Have you forgotten about Deuteronomy? Do you not remember what the law requires? It requires perfect obedience. Which is why James says over in James chapter 2 or verse 10, For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point, 
has become what? Guilty of all of it. If we broke one of the commandments, we've broken them all. We cannot pick and choose what we want to follow, which is why Paul says in Galatians 5 and verse 3, I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. Paul is saying, listen, if you want to go under the law in order to try to have a right standing with God, you've got to keep all of it. You need to go under all of it. And no one will have a right standing with God by works. Paul lets us know in Galatians 3 verse 11. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. Because none of us have kept the law. Because we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And according to 1 John 3 verse 4, that's what sin is. Sin is the transgression of the law. Whether we lied, stole, looked at a person with lust, or disobeyed our parents, we have all broken God's holy and righteous law. And as James 2.10 lets us know, if we broke one of them, we what? Broken them all. And the penalty for sin is death. There is physical death, and then there is spiritual death, which is eternal separation from God in a place called hell. And God sent Jesus on a rescue mission to save sinners. The angel told Joseph, she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. We need to be saved from our sins. And around 2,000 years ago, God became a man in the person of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Christ lived a perfect and sinless life. He upheld the law, fulfilling all of its demands. And he went to the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Christ hung on a cross and took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoing. Christ received the penalty and the punishment that we deserve. The wrath of God against sin that should have been laid upon us was laid upon Christ at the cross. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Christ received our curse so that we might receive his blessing. And we know that death could not hold him. God raised Jesus from the dead three days later. He was demonstrating that he accepted his son as a sacrifice on behalf of sinners. And the Bible makes it very clear in Hebrews 9 and verse 27 that there is a coming day of judgment. And this is why Christ commands everybody everywhere to repent. Repentance is a change of mind. And a change of mind will always lead to a change of living. It's a change of lifestyle. It's knowing something's wrong and then turning away from it and going the complete opposite way. We need to confess our sins, turn from our sins, abandon our sins, and put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ and in Christ alone for our salvation. Christ is the only one who can save us from our sins. Christ can save us from the penalty of our sins. We are not saved by our works. And if you are trusting in works here this morning, you need to abandon that whole way of thinking and trust in Christ alone for your salvation. And the wonderful news is that God adopts us into his family through faith in Jesus Christ. We can have a new standing before God. We can have a new status before God through faith in Jesus Christ. We can be declared righteous in the sight of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Salvation is a free gift. And like any gift, it needs to be received. And I want to plead with you here this morning that if you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I want to encourage you to take that step of faith here this morning. 
10 out of 10 people die. And every day, people are stepping out into eternity without knowing Christ. And if we leave this life without knowing Christ, we will fall under the judgment of God. We will fall under His wrath. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Come to Jesus.